Good afternoon, everybody. I'm here with Joe Polizzi, who is the founder of Content Marketing Institute, which is the leading education and training organization for content marketing, and also includes the largest in-person content marketing event in the world called Content Marketing World, and I personally have never missed and never will. Uh, Joe is also the winner of the 2014 John Caldwell Lifetime Achievement Award from the Content Council, and he also just published his fourth book called Content Inc. And his third book, Epic Content Marketing, was named one of the five must-read business books of 2013 by Fortune Magazine. And if you've ever seen Joe in person, he will be wearing orange, and also he is one of the very nicest people you will ever meet. And today we are here to talk about the future of content marketing and where it is heading. Joe, how are you doing today, buddy? Dave, Dave, too kind, too kind. I'm sure everybody's sleeping through that introduction, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, but well, I'm, but I'm actually so I know we're I know nobody can see us, but I'm actually wearing orange at this time, so I, I just, <laughs> just it just you never know when I'm going outside, so I just always have to have the orange on. I hear you. Well, it wouldn't be so long if you didn't have so many accomplishments. So it's a uh, blessing and a curse, I guess. <laughs> I guess so. Well, it's all good. So, but it's good. It's good uh, talking to you today. Let's uh, let's talk some content marketing. Absolutely. Yeah. And one other thing, everyone needs to know out there is Joe is you know coined the he he uh, coined the term content marketing. He is known as uh, he is uh, known as the godfather of content marketing. So we are going to be talking about content marketing. So everyone needs to greatly pay attention because this is the number one guy in the world to listen to. So. I am super excited to talk with you today, Joe. It's always nice on a friendly level, but uh, from an education level, it's always better, very beneficial. So, yeah, let's let's uh, let's just uh, dig into it here. Uh, con future content marketing, where is heading, right? So, what do you see changing the most? Well, I think for the most part, even though content marketing as an approach uh, has been around for hundreds of years it's still a very new muscle to most organizations. Whether you're a small business, medium-sized business, or large business, doesn't matter. So this is new. I mean, the whole idea of, hey, we don't, we're not necessarily communicating in somebody else's platform anymore. We're trying to create our own valuable, compelling, and relevant information on a consistent basis to build an audience. Now, they, what we're, and you know this, and what we're seeing and what we have been seeing is this, more and more companies are creating content, more, actually more content than ever before. And even on the uh -huh. latest research that we've done says about 75% of all marketers plan on creating even more content over the next 12 months. I think that's great, but it's also a concern because more isn't always better. And uh -huh. I think what we're seeing is we, we feel this need to feed the beast, if you will, of all uh -huh. these social channels, and I, and I really don't believe there's enough thought being put into the stories we're trying to tell and actually building an audience. I mean, I think we see a lot of activity, but we don't see a lot of organizations say, yes, it, it is valuable for us as an organization to build an audience that comes to know, like, and trust us. And if we can then do that, then it will then profit the business in some way. There's not a lot of businesses, David, that are thinking about that, and I think that's the problem. And I don't know if this is a future or present thing, and but I want to answer the question. I think the biggest issue we have right now is the by far it's a minority that are actually creating what we would call a documented content marketing strategy they act, uh -huh. that they actually have a plan a business strategy for their content what are they trying to do who are they trying to target what's the story that they're trying to tell um, what is what does return what does measurement end up looking like so that you can go back to the senior level in the organization and actually say that it's doing something and actually uh -huh. write this down. Who's my audience persona? I mean, go through all those things. Uh -huh. And I think what we're seeing most in most cases is shoot first, aim later. And what we're trying to talk to more and more marketers and business owners about is, hey, let's just step back for one second before you do that next tweet or that next blog post. And let's figure out what we're actually trying to do and actually tell a story that's different. And then sort of my com concluding thoughts on this, Dave, is I think the future needs to be for companies that they have to look at the content they're creating and they have to say, is this actually a different story? Are we, telling, are we adding something that is truly different to the value of our customers' lives or jobs in some way? And I think if you're honest, anybody listening to this who's honest with themselves would probably look at the content they're creating and say, no, 
They're not. It really isn't yeah. any different. It really isn't truly valuable. And I think until we get to that point, David, that marketers are going to continue to struggle with it. No, I hear you. I hear you. And, uh, you know, and, and when you say story, just to kind of clarify for people who are just kind of getting into content marketing, and Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're not talking about the story of our company. What you're talking about is the story of whatever topic, whatever problem, whatever, whatever topic you're digging into. That, that's a great, yeah, that's a great, okay. that's a great point. All, all companies since the dawn of time, we have plenty of content about our products and services. Yeah, right. I mean, you, till, till the cows come home, right, we've got so much of that content. What we don't have is really valuable information that it may be around our products and services, but it's not about our products and services. Maybe an easiest, easier way to think about it is we may be talking about the, in our content, we, we would solve the same kind of problems our product and service does, but we do it with content. We yeah. don't do it with the product itself. So that's maybe an easier way to think about it so that if, let's say, John Deere, you know, they, one of the case studies I love to talk about is John Deere's The Furrow Magazine. You know, it's been around since 1895. They've got 1.5 million subscribers, 40 countries, 14 different languages. If you try to think of the content that they create on a monthly basis for that magazine, they're trying to help uh, farmers get more out of their land, how they can leverage technology yeah. in the right way, how they can hire yeah. the right people. But they're yes. not, it's not about the tractors themselves. It's about yes. different yes. issues, but still helping the farmer be a more successful small business owner. I, I see why you use that as a, an example. You, you couldn't have you know, provided, I think, a clearer picture for somebody who doesn't quite get it. I've, I always um, tell everybody content marketing is the easiest and hardest thing to understand. You know, when, you know, conceptually, once you understand it and you get it and a light bulb goes off, it's like, you know, a, a, you know, a fourth grader, fifth grader can, can add, like, oh, well, let's do this, let's do this, mm -hmm. let's do that. But for some reason, it's just not a straight line thinking. And, you know, and you just, a lot of people are doing it wrong. And well, you're, I mean, you're just a, it's, it's a, the, to add on to that, I think, you have to – first of all, it's not for everyone. I mean, you, a company might say, look, I, I don't want to do a content marketing approach. I want to take a very traditional approach, and that's fine. We just have to recognize that the very traditional approaches that we've used for the past 50 years aren't as effective because where we used to be able to control where our message went, in what channel, and we could be fairly certain that they would get that kind of information, a la advertising or a la exhibiting at a trade show, well, now – the control is in the, the consumers have complete control. They have a 24-7 informational device with them at all time. They can ignore your content at will. So you have uh -huh. to think about is, okay, well, when they're not forced to listen to us like they've been forced to listen to us for the past 50 years, what do we do? Well, maybe a better alternative is actually to create stuff they, that's really helpful to them. Uh -huh. And if we do that, maybe they'll keep coming back for more, just like a media company does. It's like I really – I love Inc. Magazine. I, when Inc. Magazine comes in the mail, I, I'm excited about it because I want to spend some time and engage in that. Well, that's how we need to think as companies. How can we deliver the Inc. Magazine? How can we deliver that ongoing content that they're not going to want to ignore when, as for the most part, we're putting out product and service information that they absolutely don't want except for a very small portion of the buying cycle? They 1%. Uh -huh. When they're ready to purchase, yes, they need all that information, but we're – we're so heavy loaded with content at that very small portion of the decision-making process. We have to sort of spread it out into what do we need at the top of the funnel and maybe more importantly, David, what do we need after the sale occurs? How do we keep yeah. our customers loyal? And that's the best place to start. If you were going to start anywhere, I would start with current customers and helping huh. them become create better customers from our current customer base. That's funny. If you remember yeah, 10 years ago when we started a program that you got involved with, uh, you know, for the, you know, we handled the marketing for Schweik Media, and, yeah, that's what we did. Now, uh, that was the only purpose, and we made a big mistake because we were kind of wasting it, but so then we just restructured it, and then now we were like, let's educate our customer base, you know. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's phenomenal, and also, like, during the sales process, too. You know, right before then, that's something that um, I think everybody could get better at. You know, well, I think you just are... have to do do the analysis, right? Just like you did, do the analysis. Like, where are we light? Like, wh where are customer problems coming in that yeah. we're not part of that conversation? So, a lot of people think top of the funnel because if you're not in at the very 
let's say that you believe all the statistics that between 60 and 80 percent of the B2B buyer's journey is complete before they ever look at our information as a, as a vendor. Well, if, if they're not looking at our information up front in the top of the funnel, we might not be included in that decision. So maybe you look at the top of the funnel, but that's, it's harder to do than what you, when you talked about focusing on current customers because they already know you. You don't have yeah. to sell them anything. You just have to deliver ongoing value that's outside of the product and service that you offer. That's the easiest, easiest place to start. And then you can get those people that are sharing your stuff, that are communicating how great the information that you have, and then you can go out and build more subscribers, and that helps you at the top of the funnel. And it also probably give you good content ideas, you know, for, for the top of the funnel. You know, just that's a great idea. You know, just if people can't really quite figure it out what they want to write about, what they want to talk about, okay, well, how can we help our current customers? Just and ask then, some questions. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole, you know, that's the whole Marcus Sheridan River Pools and Spas case yeah. study when he created, you know, the number one educational swimming pool blog on the mm -hmm. face of the earth. He just went out to current customers and said, what are you struggling with? What, when you were looking for, to purchase a pool, what questions did you have? You know, what mm -hmm. keeps you up at night when it comes to, you know, outdoor entertainment and things like that? And you mm -hmm. can get that stuff online, too. You can, list, you can set up listening posts on social media. But, heck, if you're out there, if you've got salespeople out there talking to current customers, that's a much better place to start than just focusing on your product and service all the time. You can actually get into a lot of the discussion with customers that doesn't involve your product. Yeah, and just a quick add-on to that. Uh, actually, just we did a podcast interview with uh, Marcus not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, and one thing I uh, learned from him uh, to incorporate this awesome idea that, that Joe's mentioning is to have a seamless rapport with your marketing department. So when you're either answering those questions, just BCC the uh, marketing department so then they can constantly see the questions that you're answering so you don't have any sort of – red tape or an extra step or, hey, look into this, just, just it's seamless. You know, as you're communicating with clients, as you're communicating and answering questions, is BCC the marketing department. And then they'll start to see, oh, here's a content idea. Oh, here's a question I've seen five or ten times. Let's dig into this one. So, that, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, yep, yeah, exactly. one of the best pointers, I think, I've, I've, you know, one of the simplest things, right? Some of the simplest things are, are, are some of the best. Now, to kind of circle back around what you were talking about earlier, you know, building your audience persona, that's where you need to start. And, and all of that, do you have some good tips on that, on how, well, helping people how to find their audience persona? Well, first of all, I think it's important to realize who is your buyer, like who's involved. So I'm going to use B2B because I know a lot of people listen to this are B, or B2B companies. So if you think about the average B2B purchase, there's seven to nine individuals involved. You have some buyer that actually signs the deal, and then you have – recommenders, you've got influencers, you've got gatekeepers, all in that process. Any one of those can be a target for your content, but you have to make a decision on who it is. That's the hardest thing that I think companies have to decide is most times when an organization will go out with a content initiative. Let's say they're like, okay, we're going to talk about um, – the, the challenges in implementing RFID equipment or whatever, and it's like, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to go out and we're going to focus on that content niche and we're going to start blogging. Well, what I want to know is who's of the nine people that's in your – part of that buyer's journey, let's say, who are you targeting? Which one of the nine? Is it the one that makes the decision? Is it the one that's recommending it to the decision maker? Is it an influencer? Is it a gatekeeper? Take it, let's, let's take a consumer example. Look at a school. If you say, okay, well, let's say uh, you want to do a content marketing approach in your university. Well, David, you know this. You've got 20 different targets in that. You could be talking to a government, uh, a government grant uh, issue. You could be talking to alumni, uh, donate, people that donate, teachers, students, parents. I mean, you've got all different places that you could be talking about. So the, so the key mistake that's often made is, we try to target too many people at one time, and if you do that, you will not be successful. So, so, so wait, do what do you suggest? On like, where would somebody like figure that out? Is it just common sense? Uh, do they just need to talk, see what their current database is, or somebody's getting started? Like, is there any sort of analysis you can do on your website traffic? Like, how, how do you how did how would one figure that out? Because 
you know, you're, you're, you presented in, I mean, presenting the, knowing the problem is, is normally the biggest part of the battle. So the fact that you're presenting it, um, is I, I would say 70% to goal, but let's tie this together. How can we help somebody figure that out? How, so the, how would we do that? Yeah. So, so let's, this is what I would do. And this is what really smart companies do when they are looking at each product and service that they have. You put, let's say that you've got XYZ product. You, you, you're selling this widget. And this widget, you need to go through the steps. I don't care what size company you are, you need to go through the steps about who buys it. So what I would do is, let's say you don't know. If you don't know, then you need to go back after somebody has made a decision. You need to go back and help them and say, I, you know, I just need to know how – how did you make your decision? If you won't mind, you know, I'll give you a discount off your product, whatever. If you could share this information because we would like to know okay. who ultimately signed for this, who was involved in the process, and you will okay. find in general that there are multiple, multiple people involved. Okay. And you should, you should have this set up for every product and service that you offer. And by the way, your sales team should know. If you yeah. have any salespeople that are worth their salt, they're going to know who the decision maker is, who they're talking to, who gets who has to get approvals, and what gatekeepers are in their way from making contact and getting a deal done. Gotcha. And you should so, and you should chart that out for each product and service that you offer. Now, then you could look at and say, okay, well, where's the problem? Let's say it's getting stuck at this influencer level, and you say, okay, well, there's something that, that's where we need to break through. Maybe if we create some kind of an informational product that goes to that influencer that we can break through that barrier and they'll be more likely to engage in our information. And if they're more likely to engage in our information, when something does come up, they'll be more likely to look at us in a positive way. Very simple to look at. Maybe that's an e-newsletter, could be a print magazine, could be anything like that. So you pick one. Instead of just saying, oh, we're going to do the magazine and we'll try to get as many people in that buying decision-making process as, as possible. You actually really want to choose one of those where basically look at a low-hanging fruit. Where are you having the problems and start there. If you're not having problems somewhere, don't focus on that. Focus on where you're having an issue that you can actually make some headway. Yeah. That's a great, I mean, that's some good stuff you just threw out there. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, a lot of it's just, you know, good old-fashioned, let's talk this out. Let, let's look into our cu current customer base, and then, you know, you have to dig, dig, dig. It's just, big, you know, it's just, I mean, a lot of times people just want, go to this website and plug in this, and your answer will be here. But, you know, the world doesn't work that way. And, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, you've got to just, you know, get, and start having the conversations with your team and digging into what's actually happening and just put your logic mm -hmm. hat on and, and figure it out, you know, and it's, I think it sounds harder than it really is. I it's think it's actually, really... it, the, the first part of that is actually not very hard. I, I in most yeah. of the companies that we go into, they already have their personas done. Yeah. They know yeah. who their buyers are, yeah. their influencers are, or gatekeepers. Where they make the mistake, Dave, is they create a program for two or so. three or four or five personas at the same time. And yeah. I always tell them, we go in and we say, this is why your program's not working. You can't be relevant to five different people at the same time. You can't. Yeah. You have to yeah. focus on one. And it's, uh -huh. just, you know, it's just a thing where they're not used to publishing. If you're in the publishing business and you understand publishing, you know this is true. We go to mechanical engineers. That's who uh -huh. we target. We don't target mechanical engineers, plant managers, and CFOs. Doesn't make yeah. any sense. Can't yeah. do that. That's a great example. I, I think I think what you just said right there, a light bulb's going off for people because content marketing really is publishing. You know, I mean, really. You know, I mean, of course, there's so many layers to it. You can do interactive. You can, you know, you know, do a podcast. You can do videos. You can do all. That. But but it's it's the idea of putting information in front of the right person who then engages and, and builds trust and then. Well, and then it, it it actually. I mean, that's why that's why I probably uh, am drawn to it so much because I come from a publishing background. But if you just look at the basic definition of content marketing, we're trying to create valuable, relevant, compelling content on a consistent basis to a very targeted audience to maintain or change behavior. That's actually the definition of publishing. The only difference is in that maintain or change behavior, if you're a media company, you're actually trying to get revenue through the selling of content or the selling of advertising. That's 99% of publishing revenues come in through paid subscriptions or paid sponsorship advertising in some way. If you are a company that you're not a media company, instead of that, you're trying to monetize through selling more products and services. 
But mm-hmm. but I've, other than that, it's all the same. It's the yeah. same exact thing. That's why I just actually this happened the other day. I was in a big long meeting with a large media company. And we were talking about who are their main competitors for the future. It's not other media companies. It's actually their advertisers hmm. because their advertisers are doing content marketing. And they're trying to create – they're trying to target the same exact people except instead of them wanting to engage in their magazine or instead of going out to vendors to have them sell uh, – buy, uh, buy advertising in some way, they're just trying to get them to go direct and say, hey, don't go to the magazine. Go directly to us because we want to sell you products and services, and that's where – that's the future of media. It's not gonna. It's gonna be the Microsoft, the Cisco systems, the big comp, Apple's, the big companies with big budgets are gonna be the future media companies. I'm doing air quotes, uh, that are going to be out there uh, because they have enough money to get this thing right. Right now, they're just not there yet, but at some point, they're gonna get it. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, it makes sense, you know. But then, you know, those people might still use the magazines, you know, to push towards them. But that's fine. You know, oh, yeah, it's you're, all, you're just, you're just another you're away. just another medium to help them out. You know, you're just you know, but yeah, but yeah, but you know, you guys talk about this all the time. I mean, businesses are you're trying to get them to become publishers, and that's that's. I mean, it's great. You know, they need to do that on their own too. You can't rely on radio or or you know social media, or you can't rely on anything. You know? Well, the thing is, is that it's it's all a measured approach. There's not one like I would never recommend and say, oh, you should drop everything else you're doing and just do content marketing. Well, that's silly. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. What we want, what we've just oh, we've just put so much money into paid. All we're saying is let's take a little bit off of paid media and let's put it into our own media properties. Because that makes sense to do that now that we can target and talk to customers directly. So no, that's all you. we've done is we've just – it's almost like uh, if you think about it this way. If you have a 401K account, we put all the – all the everything in our 401K account into company stock. Well, that's not a smart diversification strategy. Yeah. So yeah. let's take some of that off of company stock and let's spread it around to other things that make sense. Yeah. No, I mean, you, you know you know how much I believe you. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> I hear you, man. There you go. I hear you. Now, we, you know, a couple other things that, you know, we've kind of talked about a little bit. You know, what do you see changing the most? Uh, now, what, you've kind of talked about what you want to see change the most, you know. I mean, we've talked about, you know, I mean, um, or, or I guess to backtrack, we've talked about like kind of what, what do we see changing, but, you know, where do we see the most improvement needed? And we've talked about that, and to kind of recap, it's basically we need to put out better content. You need to just stop looking for – I know they say uh, the best is quantity and quality, but, you know, come on. You have budgets. You have time constraints. It's – you know, if you had to choose, you're, you're basically saying – oh, well, let me let you answer. But to pose that question, you know, where do you see the most improvement needed? You've touched on it a little bit, but – can you expand on that just a bit? Sure. I'm, yeah, David. I think that what I would, if you if you look at what most companies are doing, I would call it dabbling. They're dabbling mm-hmm. in content marketing. Oh, we doing? We got a little blog going. We got some YouTube videos going. We're doing a little bit on Facebook posts. Um, we maybe have a little e-newsletter that we're doing. They're doing everything a little bit. And they're doing everything very inconsistent, so sort of when they get to it. I mean, if Bob's not in the office to do the blog, the blog doesn't go out. You know, it's very just all over the place. It's not a priority. It's become so uh, cheap, I would say, to distribute content that people are just doing it. In the past, it, it like if you were going to do a custom magazine, you know it's going to cost you $50,000 plus an issue to do it and to do it right. So this is a – you're putting a lot of resources into it. There's a lot of thought going behind it. I don't know if there's a lot of thought going behind that corporate blog post that really doesn't cost anything but time. But that's really mm-hmm. killing us because we're looking at it totally the wrong way. So what I would do, if you are one of those companies that are sort of dabbling, I would start making a decision and be focused and say, I mean, if we look at the greatest media companies of all time and how they've become the greatest media companies, they focused for the most part on one content type to a particular audience. So they've said, all right, we're going to do textual content for the most part, audio content, video content, print content, in-person content. So they focused that first. And then... Secondarily, they say, okay, let's look at the platform. Is it my blog or website? Is it iTunes? Is it YouTube? 
They consistently deliver. And when I say consistently, I mean, hey, we're every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we're delivering a blog post. Or every month, we're delivering this amazing print magazine through the post. Or every week, we have this awesome YouTube video. So consistency, just set the expectation for content. That's your content promise to your customers. And then over time, if you're going to build an audience, and this is, again, just look at history, it takes about 9 to 12 months or more to really do this right to really build an audience that's worth its salt. It's not going to happen overnight. This is not a short-term fix. We always say it's a marathon, not a sprint. So that's mm -hmm. so if anybody listening to that, that's kind of what I would look at is just maybe not, not create content in every possible channel wherever your customers are at. Focus on something that's going to make an impact to a particular person, an audience. Do it really well consistently over time. Build a subscription base. Focus on getting those email subscribers in those subscribers on YouTube, those subscribers on iTunes, wherever you build this, print subscribers if you have to print magazine, and then deliver on that promise on a regular basis. That's, it doesn't matter so how many new channels not, pop up, that's the way that success has been for the last 100-plus years. So the people who are dabbling and not being consistent and doing it here, would you just tell them, hey, freeze, stop, save up your ideas and your plan and get everything together and then get going consistently in like three months? Or is dabbling better than not doing it at all? No, I would say probably dabbling is – well, I'm yeah, under the tough, assumption, in my, right. in my experience, if you're a dabbler, if you're sort of all over the place, it's probably not doing anything for your business. So and make it. I mean, look at it. If it's not doing anything for your business, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. And a lot, and a lot of small – I mean – in the beginning, so 10 years ago, I worked with a lot of small businesses, and when we looked at what they were doing, they were just doing it because they thought they were supposed to do it. Thought, that, oh, yeah. we, need to, we need to launch a blog. We have to be on Twitter. We need to have a Facebook yeah. page. Well, now we're realizing yeah. it. No, you don't. You, you yeah. really don't. What you need mm -hmm. to do is you need to commit to something that's going to make an impact on the business and do that, and the stuff that's not, don't do it. Yeah. So that's it. Pretty, pretty, pretty simple, right? <laughs> It's like just that, hard to do because we feel like, yeah. oh my God, we got to have the Facebook page. And I would, I would say that, I would say that probably 90% of businesses out there with a Facebook page would be better off if they didn't have it and they diverted that attention to something else that's going to make an impact on their customers' lives. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm hearing you loud and clear. I hope everyone else is too. You know, you, you know, you started with, hey, focus, everybody, listen up, focus before you start. Know why, know where, you know. And and then as you get going, again, focus everybody. You know, it's about being getting a consistent plan together. It's not like I think what is it, Tony Robbins say or something, you know, you know, that motivation is he uh they don't, you know, tell people to just to bathe once, you know, because then you'll start you know, it's an everyday thing. It's an ongoing thing. And if you don't do it, it's gonna start stinking, you know. So yeah, I mean, you know, you've been very consistent with your entire message this entire time, and you've talked about four or five, you know, six different things. But it really comes down to getting a plan, being consistent, knowing why you're doing it, and who you're doing it for, and, and, and making that, a choice. And, and that's yeah. the thing. I mean, that's the whole thing about a strategy is that right now most businesses aren't making a choice. You have to say no to things. You mm -hmm. can't do everything. So say no to as much as you can so the, the things that you say yes to really make an impact on your business. Gotcha. All right, cool. Now um, getting into kind of the future of like, you know, do you, do you uh, as far as like the marketplace, the content marketing, you know, I, I guess marketplace, so to speak, um, do you see like, do you foresee in like oversaturation of, you know, not only like content, but like content marketing companies coming in? Um, you know, people. I, you know, we've talked about. Yeah, there's a lot of you know people out there just putting out crap. I mean, do you do you see an oversaturation coming? And in, in, in what are going to be the pitfalls, or what are going to be the things that people are going to need to do to kind of overcome it? So it's kind of a two-part question. Do you see an oversaturation yeah. of content marketing coming in? And then, as far as just content marketing in general, you know, with that oversaturation, if there is one, you know, you see coming, which I think you already well, touched on. What do you what do you see to kind of break out of that? Well, there's two things. It's a really important question. There's two things. One, on the consumer side, there's no oversaturation. If you want, if you wanted to say that there's too much content, there's been too much content since the dawn of the printing press. 
-hmm. There's always been too much content that we can engage in. I think if you talk to anybody in, in your family, you talk to your close friends, you'd say, hey, are, is there a content overload? They, they don't think of that. They don't think about it that way. This is a very marketing-centric thing. So marketers out there think there's way too much content because they're producing all this content, and it drives them crazy. Now, mm -hmm. on the thought, let's, so let's put the consumers to the side, and let's just look at sort of the, the inside baseball look at the content marketing industry. Uh, basically, every agency on the planet now says they have some kind of a content marketing uh, plan, process, executables, those things. Search engine companies, search engine agencies, social agencies, I think what you'll see is you're going to start to see some consolidation. We've already seen a little bit of it. You'll see bigger agencies uh, uh, purchase smaller agencies. We're starting to see that. You'll continue to see that. Uh, because not everybody and their brother is going to do content marketing the right way, or they're going to say, oh, look, we see some opportunities. So you're going to see that. You're going to see uh, a lot of, and we, we've talked about this quite a bit, as you know, where you're going to see a lot of brands go out there and buy small media companies and bloggers out there uh, because they have, they have the funds to do that, and bloggers maybe not, don't have the revenue model that they can support keeping going with what they're doing. So you're going to see a lot of that happen. You're going to see a, there's way too many tech companies out there. The content and social media and the Marcom or Martech space, uh, marketing technology space, is so crowded with content tools right now. So you're going to see uh -huh. some go out of business, as many of them do. You're going to see some consolidate. You're going to get, see some get bought out. So I think that my prediction is in 2017 you'll see less content marketing technology companies that you saw in 2016 just because – you're not going to see those venture dollars just flow to everyone undiscriminating like they've been floating around. So I think you're going to see a lot. Of, I think all this, by the way, David, is good for the industry. I think we're getting to a level of maturity. We have to start taking seriously what technology makes sense. I mean, even with marketing automation technology, I mean, most marketers don't leverage with 90%, you know, 90 percent of the features of a marketing automation program are not leveraged right now. We only mm -hmm. use about five to ten percent of that, so we yeah we, we we almost jumped to technology too soon. Where I'd like to see a little bit more. Hey, let's really figure out where our problems are at, and then when the pain is so bad, then we can jump to technology. But we te we don't do that. So I think you're going to see a lot of change in the next year, uh, but I think it all uh, it will all be good in the long run. Cool. All right, just just one final question, and um, you know we've talked about a lot. I, I can see how. It, some people listening to are like just jotting down notes, you know, you know, basically sharpening their strategy and and really digging in. There's probably other people listening that are like, oh my god, this, I'm sold. I need to do this, but oh my god, there's so many things, right? And there's people who have budget, don't have budgets, whatever. So, what would be your opinion of companies, business owners, whomever that that really want to market themselves this way? About going about it themselves versus, versus hiring an you know an outside agency. You know how, how would a CEO a business owner come to this conclusion for themselves? Sure. The every almost every company out there does a little bit of both. They have some that's created inside the company, and they have some that's created outside, either by outside agencies or outside writers or content producers. There's mm -hmm. no model to say that, oh, it has to be mostly outsourced and mostly insourced, that actually I've seen it both at work. What is key is that the strategy remains internal. So first do your strategy with your team, with your marketing team, the business owners associated with that, create the strategy that makes sense, and then go down the list of what do you have internal that makes sense from a content creation standpoint, and what don't you have? Just make so that if list. If you don't have content creators, well, yeah, that, if you don't that, have that. people, if you if you decide that the, a blog is the best thing to do and you want to do a daily blog and you look inside and you say, we don't have this, we don't have yeah. writers that can produce content every day, you're going to have to go outside and find somebody to help if that's what the that strategy makes, dictates. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, just to kind of break it down on a level I think everybody can understand is I need a website built. Do I have a developer? <laughs> right? That's right. Do I have somebody who can build a website? Okay, we'll use them, you know. And if you don't, then don't. You know, do I have somebody who's versed in marketing automation here? If so, or you know, has the intelligence, you know, and that kind of intelligence, you know, likes to dig into stuff, then hey, 
you know, if they have the time and you're already paying them a salary, you know, have them dig into it. If you don't have that, then you go outside, you know, assuming you have the budget for it. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's really one of the most clear um, questions, I think, answers that I've ever heard on that is just Well, you, you got it exactly right, David, and I think that's where – the reason why so many companies get involved and don't do this the right way is they don't do the plan up front. If you do the plan up front, you realize, okay, uh, we need somebody to run our audience development and really figure out our subscribers. Do we have somebody that can do that or we need some help outside? You know, we, we need to create, uh, we need uh, this content created on Exhibit. We need this audio program created on this basis. We need somebody to oversee it and somebody to create it and somebody to edit it and somebody to proofread it. Do we have, what do we have inside? Outside, and then you just make those, you just look at those, and if you got it, great. And if it makes sense for the business, great. Or if it's too painful for the business, outsource it. Um, yeah, there, and there's no one way to do it. The only thing I'll say is the strategy has to be inside. Don't outsource your strategy to some outside agency that, that says they'll, they know your business better than you do. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Joe, I appreciate your time today. I, I, I definitely picked up some some pointers for, for myself and things that I'm going to be digging into personally with, with our company, and um, I, I'm sure everybody else also did uh, pick up a lot of stuff today. But can you um, – obviously, there's a lot more to be learned, a lot more to be said. Why don't you tell everybody the best ways to follow you, to learn from you? Um, obviously, we can – Touch. You have a content marketing world. It's always in September. Am I correct about that? Sure. Yep. Yep. A content marketing world. 2016 is September 6th through 9th in Cleveland, Ohio. You can go to contentmarketingworld.com for any of the other events that we do, um, and to subscribe to our newsletters and get our magazine, Chief Content Officer. Just go to contentmarketinginstitute.com. And then for me personally, I'm at Joe Polizzi, P-U-L-I-Z-Z-I, on Twitter. And then everything with the new book. Content Inc. is content-inc.com, and there's actually a free, a couple free goodies, like a free chapter and a free ebook there uh, if you want to test it out before you decide maybe if you want to buy it or not. But lots of, lots of free things on that site. Very cool. Let me, let me spell that name for everybody again. It, again, it's at J-O-E-P-U-L-I-Z-Z-I. All right. Well, hey, Joe, appreciate it, man, and we will um, hopefully be doing this again soon. Thanks, David. Always a pleasure talking with you. Appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye.